Well, hello, fellow Sojourners, and welcome back to another edition of Appropriate in the Culture. On our 50th episode, I was all set to talk about Ukraine, just war theory, American culpability, and the Christian response. But then I got sent this article, We Will Answer for What We Watch, and I got triggered. So, trigger warning, today some content may not be suitable for children. I'm Pastor Shane, and I'll be spitting fire today as we appropriate some culture. <laughs> Now, to begin, I like Kevin DeYoung. I've quoted him in sermons. I've liked and agreed with many things that he said. I've liked and agreed with many things that he's written. And more often than not, he provides a clear thinking, biblically grounded perspective, which is why I was particularly disheartened to read his article, We Will Answer for What We Watch of Squid Games in High Places. Because unlike his usual fare, what I found was poor hermeneutics, bad exegesis, cultural ignorance, and thinking so shallow I would let a toddler play in it. Did I mention I was triggered? The inanity begins this way. And Jehoash did what was right in the eyes of the Lord all his days. Nevertheless, the high places were not taken away. It is possible for God's people to get many things right while still getting one very important thing wrong. Several times during the years of the divided monarchy, we read of basically good kings who basically did what was right, kings like Jehoshaphat, Jehoash, Amaziah, Azariah, and Jotham. Each one walked in the ways of God, and yet all of them failed to address one critical area of disobedience. The people still sacrificed and made offerings on the high places. These local shrines were used for making sacrifices, burning incense, holding feasts, and celebrating festivals. They were pagan places devoted to the worship of pagan gods. The high places were too normal and too popular for God's people to remove them. Which brings me to Squid Game. Does it, though? That seems a rather circuitous route. Basically, the South Korean television series was popular. Kevin DeYoung didn't like it, though it's not entirely clear if he actually watched it. But either way, it's condemnable because watching a television show is the same thing as worshiping a pagan god. You're going to have to show your work on that. Because in my reading of Scripture and what we have constantly and repeatedly demonstrated through Scripture on this program is that sin is not external. Here's Jesus. Again, Jesus called the crowd to him and said, Listen to me, everyone, and understand this. Nothing outside a person can defile them by going into them. Rather, it is what comes out of a person that defiles them. Worshiping a false god is sin, but watching other people worship false gods isn't. Or does he think that Paul is sinning when he was walking around in Athens? While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. He sees their sin, and it does distress him, but then he uses their sin as a cultural touchstone to argue on behalf of the gospel. Gee, what a novel idea. But more than that, the scriptural reference in DeYoung's article makes no sense whatsoever. Because if the idea is that watching Squid Game is the equivalent to idol worship, well, the kings of Judah are not condemned because they personally watched Squid Game or personally worshipped false gods. They're criticized because they did not destroy the high places. They did not destroy the means for other people to worship false gods. So if we're actually using this passage as a prescriptive for Christian living, the application would actually be that it's not enough for you personally to not watch Squid Game. You must also destroy the Netflix servers. Now, if that sounds silly to you, that's because it is. Did I mention that I'd be spitting fire today? Bad exegesis, bad. All right, but what is the problem with Squid Game? The South Korean television series about 456 indebted and down on their luck players who receive a mysterious invitation to participate in a survival game with hopes of winning 4.56 billion won, more than 38 million. Although the contests involve children's games, of which Squid Game is one, the premise of the show is anything but kid friendly. Why on earth does everything have to be kid-friendly? Why is this such a common Christian thought that all art has to be kid-friendly? Not all stories worth telling are kid-friendly. Not all concepts, not all ideas worth exploring are kid-friendly, including the Bible. It's not all kid-friendly. I never once walked in during children in worship and heard the story of Lot and his daughters. 
Never once saw teaching curriculum centered on the Levite and his concubine in Judges 19. Never once saw Ezekiel 23.20 as the memory verse for that week. But all scripture is God-breathed, and all of it is useful, even though not all of it is kid-friendly. And thinking that all of art must be kid-friendly is a juvenile thought. And one of the things that the Bible does tell us repeatedly is to grow up. 1 Corinthians, when I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. Innocent, yes, childish, no. And too many Christians are very childish about art. As we've laid out a number of times in this program, some of the most disturbing and insidious material out there is quote-unquote kid-friendly. G-rated doesn't mean good, and M-A or R doesn't mean bad. That's a ridiculously simplistic and childish way of viewing media. All right, so Squid Game isn't for children. Fair enough. But what's exactly the problem? Every game ends in death, often extremely graphic and violent, with each death adding another 100 million won to the grand prize. Isn't this just another Hunger Games? Not exactly. According to IMDb, Parents Guide for Squid Game, here's what you can expect from the show. In episode 4, a man and a woman have sex in a bathroom and female nudity is shown. In another episode, an older man removes his bathrobe and requests a younger man to satisfy him. In the same episode, there are many nude women with paintings on their body, and that's to say nothing of several uses of swear words. Korean swear words. Unless, of course, you're watching the dubbed version, which is really the worst sin. All right, so some sex, brief nudity, some language, a lot of violence. And those parental guides are good tools to use to inform an audience of what is in the movie or television show so that you can make informed decision as to whether you want to engage with the material or not. But the problem is the parental guides don't really provide context. They tell you what happened. It doesn't tell you why it happened or what it means. So let's use this example. An older man removes his bathrobe and requests a younger man to satisfy him. Oh, gosh, that's horrifying. But it doesn't happen, and in context, it's a scene condemning hedonism and vilifying sexual perversion and insatiable lust, which is a biblical point of view. What's the substantive difference between that and, say, this passage in Genesis? Before they had gone to bed, all the men from every part of the city of Sodom, both young and old, surrounded the house. They called to Lot, Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us so that we can have sex with them. Lot went outside to meet them and shut the door behind him and said, No, my friends, don't do this wicked thing. Look, I have two daughters who have never slept with a man. Let me bring them out to you, and you can do what you like with them. But don't do anything to these men, for they have come under the protection of my roof. Well, that's horrifying. But we understand those accounts in context. And likewise, the Bible is not the only place that we need to apply proper hermeneutics. That's true of all literature, all written work, and stage and film productions too. Otherwise, you're engaged in nothing but special pleading, which is a logical fallacy. Now, to be fair, Kevin does acknowledge an aspect to this. He says, some Christians will be quick to point out that the Bible is full of sex and violence, and indeed it is. But there is a world of difference between sin described honestly on a page, never with the intent to stimulate or amuse, and sin depicted on the screen with multi-million dollar budgets, real nudity, and realistic gore. Okay, now we're just begging the question. Do they not teach logic in seminary? A lot of assumptions in lieu of an argument. You say that there is a world of difference between sin described honestly on the page and multi-million dollar budget with real nudity and realistic gore, but that's an assumption as you don't bother to explain why there's a world of difference, which is your whole argument. Let's take it one by one and see how silly it is. Multi-million dollar budget. So Squid Game would be fine if it were made cheaper. What does budget have to do with anything? And actually, the most problematic things, things like profanity, nudity, and gore, are really cheap, which is why they're staples of things like slasher flicks. Uh, the first, Friday the 13th, was made for $550,000, and the vast majority of them were made for under $3 million. What does budget have to do with anything? Next, real nudity. So if it's CGI naughty parts, it's fine? Manga nudity, anime nudity, totally fine. It's not real, right? Well, okay, so it's not the realism that's the problem. It's just that there is nudity. 
Oh, no. I guess if we're tearing down the high places, we should also add the Sistine Chapel and the Louvre to the list. Or have we gotten back to the place where context actually matters? But Kevin doesn't know the context because he didn't watch it. Or did he? Next, realistic gore. Seriously? Does context matter again? But let's go back to that earlier assumption. In what way is there a world of difference between sin depicted honestly on the page and sin depicted on the screen? Would the novelization of Squid Game be fine? Is Fifty Shades of Grey fine as the book, but deplorable as the movie? I mean, sin doesn't get in through word form, it only gets in through visual mediums, obviously, that's just science. And notice the other assumption built in, but not defended, which is the Bible depicts sin honestly, but movies and television only depict it to stimulate or amuse. Really? They can't present it honestly? It's just stimulate or amuse in some base way? It's not there to get us to think or ponder or reflect or feel or move us? This reduction of entertainment as vapid stimulation and amusement is without merit. Movies and television are entertaining, but they're powerful things. They convey ideas. They can shape thinking. They can change hearts and minds. And the reality is, if we're practicing proper hermeneutics, the themes and ideas of Squid Game are not actually antithetical to a Christian worldview. And that is certainly not the case with a lot of entertainment. But when we don't think critically about these issues, we get statements like this. Does anything with an MA rating on Netflix help us think about what is pure, lovely, commendable, excellent, and worthy of praise? Well, I mean, yeah. I've been edified by R-rated material, haven't you? Uh, Kevin continues. Recently, I preached on 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 7, 1, which includes Paul's command, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Okay, that's talking about marriage. Christians shouldn't marry non-believers. I don't think anyone is planning on marrying Squid Game. Be separate from them, touch no unclean thing. Let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit. That's not the message we want to hear from the church, but it is almost certainly the message virtually all of us need to hear. It is hard to imagine many of us are too careful with the sex, nudity, and graphic violence we put before our eyes. We are to be separate, but we're to be separate in holiness and righteousness, not trivialities. If it's just separation, then go be Amish. Why wear a suit and tie? That's cultural. Be separate. Wear a sweatsuit and groucho glasses. That'd be different. That'd separate you. No, we're called to separation in righteousness, not trivialities. What you're talking about, Kevin, Paul actually warned against. Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These rules, which have to do with things that are all destined to perish with use, are based on merely human commands and teachings. Such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humility, and their harsh treatment of the body, but they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. Because once again, sin is not external. That is not a biblical notion. Now, temptation can be external. So I'm not saying that we shouldn't be cautious or prudent or wise. I'm not saying watch whatever you want all the time. And I'm not saying that you have to watch Squid Game. You do not and you should not violate your conscience. But here's the thing. The culture is not going to get better by a lack of Christian engagement. And if we misconstrue and misrepresent sin as being external, then we cannot live in. If you're in the world talking to non-believers, you might hear some profanity. And hearing profanity is a sin, right? If you're around sinners, you might see some things. Immodesty in dress, indecency, risque things. And seeing that is sin, right? Scripture calls us to be in the world, but not of the world, and we fail in both ways. But that's what we need to be aiming for. And the way that we do that is by being transformed by the Spirit from within, not through quarantine. Because sin is not external. The problem is in here. Quarantining doesn't address that. It just gives us a false sense of moral superiority and self-righteousness. 
All right, we'll stop there. But as always, if you disagree, please leave a comment or a question, and I'll be sure to respond to that. You can find my deplorable self on Facebook, Twitter, and Locals. Like, subscribe, rate, review, and I'll see you back here next week for more Appropriate in the Culture.